Thanks for joining this episode of the number 86 lecture series, which continues the conversation in the 85 Federalist Papers about the role of the legislature. Today's episode features Professor Keith E. Whittington, the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Politics at Princeton University. Professor Whittington is widely regarded as one of the preeminent scholars on the American Constitution. As always, the Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. What experiences did the founders consider when drafting Article I of the Constitution? What were their primary concerns about a federal legislature? So the framers have some experience with legislatures, um, both with what parliament did, but also what colonial legislatures did and what state legislatures did. And so they uh, knew that the new Congress should exercise um, um, a lot of the same kinds of basic powers. Um, So they expected Congress to uh, be able to uh, raise taxes. Um, They expected Congress to make fundamental decisions about spending. They expected Congress to be able to make important policy decisions about um, setting uh, legal mandates um, for the people and how they'd be uh, able to govern. Um, They had less of a well-worked out idea about um, what kind of oversight Congress would do of the executive branch. They anticipated um, some aspects of oversight, um, certainly in the uh, most extreme case of impeachment um, as an ability to remove executive branch officers who are engaging in misconduct. Well, certainly part of what the framers in Philadelphia are thinking about is how the state governments had worked um, after the American Revolution. Yeah. So one thing Madison is very concerned about is how do you make um, constitutions more effective um, so you can actually enforce uh, limitations and not just write down what he characterizes as parchment barriers. The other thing about those state constitutions is they uh, weighted the balance of power um, in those state systems very heavily toward the legislature. Um, So they created very weak courts and very weak governors um, for the most part, in part because um, the drafters of those state constitutions during the American Revolution were very distrustful um, of courts um, and the executive branch. They won very powerful um, legislatures. And by the time of the Philadelphia Convention, the Federalists had really decided that those state uh, legislatures were too powerful, um, that the uh, courts and the governors um, didn't have enough of a capacity to push back against legislatures. And that was bad, both in the sense that um, they couldn't prevent the legislature from abusing power on its own, um, but also they couldn't stand up to legislatures when legislatures started stealing powers away uh, from the executive and the judiciary. And so uh, when Madison and others looked at what the state experience had been like in the first decade after the American Revolution, part of what he saw was um, very grasping legislatures um, that were willing to take over executive powers and really even take over judicial powers um, and push aside the other branches of government. Um, And so part of what Madison's concerned about is how do you keep legislatures not only from abusing the rights of citizens by doing things that even you've specifically written in the Constitution they shouldn't do, but also how do you keep them from uh, running over the top of courts and um, executive branch officials. So each of the first three articles of the U.S. Constitution um, describes a different branch of government. So Article 1 describes the Congress, the legislative branch. Article 2 describes the executive. And Article 3 describes the judiciary. And each starts the same way, in that each starts with a vesting clause that vests the powers um, of that branch of government and that set of government officials. And so Article 1 begins by vesting legislative power um, in the legislature, the new legislature being created by Article 1, the Congress. Um, but Article One's vesting clause looks a little different than the vesting clause of Article Two and Article Three, um, because it doesn't vest all legislative power in Congress. It vests the legislative power that's here and granted um, to Congress. Because elsewhere in Article One, um, the founders actually specify exactly what legislative powers Congress is supposed to exercise. Um, And so they're not trying to give all the legislative power that exists in the United States or even in the federal government necessarily um, to Congress. They're trying to give them very specific powers. Um, And this is partially a concern with federalism. Um, How do you uh, create a system in which Congress is going to have some legislative tasks to to perform, um, but also the state governments are going to have legislative tasks to perform? Um, And that effort to enumerate a set of powers um, that Congress is going to exercise um, is an effort to try to find that balance between what you expect Congress to do going forward and what you expect state legislatures to do going forward. What about the experience that the founders had with Parliament? Did that also contribute in any way to how they conceived of a new American legislature? 
they're British writers who are trying to think about what kinds of powers Parliament ought to be exercising, and they've uh, created a category of things that they think of as legislative powers um, in particular. Um, but all that's still fluid, and there's still debates both in Europe and in the United States over um, what the full scope of those legislative powers are, what exactly falls in that category of legislative powers. And some of the powers that are explicitly vested in Congress, we might not think of as being very nationally legislative in their nature. So, for example, the taxing authority um, is not uh, the same as the power to make law in general. Um, it's a power that Parliament claimed, a power that we increasingly thought belonged with the legislature, um, but it's not necessarily naturally a legislative power as such. I mean, one thing at the very beginning of Article One does. Uh, take account of is the fact that there's going to be two chambers of Congress. So Article I, investing legislative power, um, vested in a Congress, and then specifies that the Congress consists of both a Senate and a House of Representatives. The rest of Article I then goes on to detail what those two uh, chambers look like. Um, but again, this is partially an English inheritance that um, uh, the parliament was a two-chambered body. Um, the framers were familiar with two-chambered body. A lot of the colonial legislatures had two chambers as well. Um, and so they were building that into the Congress um, also. And that gets referenced right up front that that's both those chambers are going to be part of the single national legislature. Um, it's not just the House of Representatives, for example, this is the true legislature. And we might think of the Senate as being um, an advisory body Body to the executive branch, for example. Instead, the Senate is understood to be a full-fledged member of the legislative branch itself. So the framers have a set of expectations about what a legislature is likely to do and what the legislative power looks like in practice. And at the very heart of that idea about what the legislative power is, um, is the ability to make broad policy that's general. Um, so what um, has emerged out of England, what develops in Montesquieu's writings and the writings of other political philosophers at the time, um, is they think of the executive and judicial power is about applying general rules to specific individuals um, and bringing force to bear to um, make sure those rules are actually implemented. What's distinctive about the legislative power is it's not thinking about specific individuals. It's not thinking about how policy is going to be applied on the ground. It's trying to think about what are the general rules that ought to guide society more generally. And so the concern of the legislature is try to develop those general rules. Um, they're not just about specific individuals or specific situations, but are trying to provide general guidelines um, to regulate society uh, more broadly. Um, in addition, there's a set of powers they also think fall within the scope of what legislatures ought to be concerned with, um, including the power of the purse and the ability to control uh, money, both raising money for the government, but also spending uh, money. There's an expectation that the legislature will do some oversight of the executive branch in order to see how laws are being played out, but also provide a check um, on the executive branch. Um, they don't have very well worked out views about what that oversight looks like, um, but we see an example of uh, part of what they're thinking about in the impeachment power, um, which they entrust in Congress the ability to remove executive branch officials um, that they think are engaging in misconduct in an extreme way, uh, which presumes that the legislature is going to be a body that in part is going to be watching over other um, branches of government on behalf of the people that elect the legislature and put them in place um, in the first place. You mentioned how the idea for two chambers in the legislature came from the British experience. Can you elaborate on why the founders thought that was so important? Did they craft different roles for the House of Representatives and the Senate? Right, so partially the, the framers in drafting the Constitution and drafting Article One is vesting legislative power in Congress um, broadly, but they're also singling out a few powers and entrusting them specifically to single chambers of Congress, um, and particularly the Senate. And so one way in which um, they were familiar of upper chambers operating um, in the colonial period in the early state legislatures uh, was there might be an upper chamber of the legislature that was really an advisory body um, to the governor. Um, and exercise some checks on the governor, but also advise the governor on making policy of various sorts. Um, and some of those kind of traditional functions were entrusted specifically to the Senate. And part of the goal there was to provide a kind of check on the new president. So take powers that might have existed only in the hands of the king in the context of England, um, and instead required they be shared between the president um, and the Senate. So the president was not as powerful um, as a king might be. So, for example, 
um, the treaty making power is a power that's shared between the Senate um, and the president. It's not strictly a legislative power per se. It's not a law making power. It's not a congressional power. It's a power that's entrusted specifically to the Senate in cooperation with the president of the United States. Um, likewise, the Senate's given a role in confirming appointees that the um, president might make both to judicial offices and also to um, executive branch offices where um, the president can not simply make appointments on his own. Um, the Senate has to cooperate with that. But again, that's not a specifically legislative function. Um, it's an additional function that um, the framers entrusted um, to the Senate specifically. Um, and then also the Senate's singled out and being the place where um, uh, all impeachments will be tried. Um, and again, that's not a specifically legislative function. Um, it's a specialized function, uh, really more of a judicial uh, function um, that uh, the Senate is serving um, in that context. But the framers needed to vest it somewhere um, and the Senate seemed like the best place to um, give that kind of elevated additional power um, to help check um, other branches of government. Does the Constitution deliberately make it difficult for the Senate to exercise power? Can you give a brief explanation about how and when a supermajority is required? What purpose does the filibuster serve? So the Constitution, um, unlike the Articles of Confederation, mostly works on a majoritarian basis. So one of the problematic features of the Articles of Confederation, the first federal constitution, was it often required supermajorities in order to get anything done. So all the important decisions um, that the Congress was making under the Articles of Confederation could not be done on a supermajority basis. They really required supermajorities, which often meant they were very hard to do. Um, so in designing the Congress, the framers really um, shifted toward a more majoritarian kind of body, um, so it would be easier to make policy in general. Um, and so there are very few exceptions where they wanted to carve out an additional supermajority role, um, most notably in order to um, uh, ratify treaties. Um, uh, there was going to be a supermajority requirement in the Senate, so you couldn't simply do it uh, with a simple majority, but you needed more than that. Um, and likewise, to potentially override presidential vetoes for legislation. And so again, there's an effort to try to balance um, the president versus Congress. They wanted to give the president an ability to check Congress uh, to some degree by giving him a veto power. Um, but they also decided they didn't want that to be an absolute veto power. They wanted to be qualified. So there's an ability to override. Um, and of course, then if you're going to have an ability to override, you need something other than the simple majority um, to pass the law in the first place. And so it's a place where there's a supermajority requirement um, in that context as, as well. Um, but otherwise, generally, the drafters really preferred um, as often as possible to create uh, simple majorities for how Congress operates. In one place where we tend to think of there being a kind of supermajority requirement built into the way our system actually works is in the context of a Senate filibuster. It's notable that Senate filibusters are not built into the constitutional text itself, but are rather a function of the internal rules of the Senate. Um, and the Senate has changed those rules over time as to um, how many votes does it take to stop a filibuster and move on with legislative business. Um, and over time, the Senate has actually tended to reduce how big that majority needed to be. Um, so the earlier in American history it required a very large majority. Now it only requires 60 votes in order to overcome a filibuster. Um, the Senate is now tending to shrink the scope of how many things can be subject to a filibuster so that fewer and fewer things are actually subject to the possibility of a filibuster. Um, but that's one instance in which the Senate has internally constructed a kind of supermajority rule um, for lots of important um, policy decisions, um, but one that the Constitution itself doesn't actually require. Um, but we've regarded it as a, a very basic feature for a very long time of how the system actually works as a kind of protection for minority interests uh, within the Congressional process, um, but one that we've been chipping away at over time. Earlier, you mentioned impeachment as a power entrusted to the Senate. Doesn't the House of Representatives have a role in that process also? How does it work? Why did the founders design it this way? So notably, the impeachment power is not naturally a kind of legislative power. It's a special power being given to Congress, and it's being given to the two chambers of Congress. Um, in order to deal with the possibility there might be misconduct that occurs uh, in other parts of the government. And you need some kind of tool built into the government to address misconduct when it might arise. And so the way the framers constructed that is to charge each chamber of Congress with a somewhat different responsibility um, relative to that kind of misconduct. 
that charged the House uh, with the responsibility of being able to pursue an impeachment in the first place, which means it's charged the House with the ability to investigate possibilities of misconduct and come to some conclusions about whether or not they think misconduct has occurred. Um, the Constitution doesn't specify the details of what that kind of investigation might look like. Um, it simply says that the House has the power to impeach. And so it leaves the details of the process to the House itself to make a determination as to how to proceed. And you can imagine some circumstances in which the House goes into quite lengthy and detailed investigations in order to try to get the bottom of some accusations of misconduct. And you can imagine other circumstances in which the misconduct is evident to everybody and a minimal kind of effort um, needs to take place in order to investigate. The Senate, on the other hand, is charged with um, hearing those charges and ultimately uh, making a more judicial-like ruling as to whether or not somebody is actually guilty of those charges. And so then we might conceptualize the House as serving the role of something like a prosecutor who brings the charges to the Senate, and then the Senate serves a role more like a set of judges um, who are trying to evaluate whether or not the evidence and the law um, actually results in uh, demonstrating that somebody is engaged in a kind of misconduct. Senators are expected in that context to not be acting out of purely partisan motives. They're not expected to be acting out of purely political motives. The goal is they're supposed to be thinking about what kinds of misconduct has been charged about somebody, um, what's the evidence at hand about whether or not they're actually guilty of those charges, and then they're ultimately rendering a verdict on that. And they're not just simply declaring, we think somebody ought to be removed from office. They're declaring that somebody is actually guilty of having committed specific and uh, impeachable offenses. Um, it's also true, though, on the other hand, despite the fact that it's a, it is a quasi-judicial process, senators take an oath to um, uh, treat um, the defendant fairly in this context. They follow rules of procedure um, uh, in this process to hear certain rules of evidence and collect testimony um, in the context of the trial. But the Senate is limited as to what kind of penalties they can impose on the backside um, of the impeachment process. So they have the capacity to judge somebody guilty, um, but they didn't, then do not have um, a full arsenal of different kinds of consequences they can impose on a guilty party at that point. All they can do is remove somebody from office um, or perhaps take the additional step of disqualifying them from future office, um, but they cannot impose any additional criminal penalties um, on somebody, even if, they think they, even if the Senate thinks um, that the impeached individual is in fact guilty of criminal offenses. Um, those criminal charges have to be separately pursued in the ordinary courts through the ordinary criminal process, and ordinary criminal punishment would be imposed um, in that context. It's something that occurs outside the context of impeachment. In the beginning of the podcast, you discussed how the British experience shaped the founders' ideas about the legislature. What about these impeachment powers? Was the process similar in the parliamentary system? They're familiar with an impeachment power that Parliament had exercised um, before, so they were familiar with such a practice. Um, but what partially motivates them to want to include that in the Constitution was the creation of an independent president, um, where they're worried that a very powerful officer uh, with a fairly lengthy term, um, something could go wrong um, until before the next election. So you might need some kind of mechanism um, to be able to remove an officer under those circumstances um, before the next election might occur. And once they start thinking in those terms, then they start thinking, well, well, that ought to be true for all kinds of officers in the um, federal government, including executive branch officials, but also including judges, um, should be subject to the same kind of rule. They then model the impeachment power off of parliamentary practice, although they do make some significant modifications um, in it as well in trying to import it um, into the American system. And the impeachment power, as it's embedded in the Constitution, really has two core components, one primarily procedural and the other primarily substantive. The procedural component um, is that the U.S. House of Representatives has the impeachment power. And so by a simple majority vote, uh, it can impeach an officer, um, which we might uh, think of as being like a grand jury indictment. It's basically an accusation um, that some kind of misconduct has occurred. Um, the Senate, on the other hand, is entrusted with the power to try impeachments. And so once an impeachment has been made by the House, those charges are then carried over to the Senate, um, and the Senate has to have a trial uh, in order to decide what to do with those charges, decide whether or not the individual is actually guilty of those charges. Um, but unlike the House, which can impeach based on a simple majority vote, um, in the Senate, it requires a two-thirds majority in order to um, actually convict somebody um, of, a, of a charge of impeachment. And so it's a much higher hurdle to get over um, in the Senate than it is in the House. In practice, that means it's largely required some bipartisan agreement in order to actually convict an officer. 
um, in the Senate because one party's unlikely control enough seats in the Senate to be able to do it all on their own, whereas it's easier to impeach it in the House. You only need a simple majority. It can be done um, on a partisan basis more easily. The second component of the impeachment power is primarily a substantive component. So in addition to setting up the rules about um, who does the impeaching and who does um, the uh, trial, um, often impeachment. Um, the Constitution also specifies um, that substantively you can only impeach under certain circumstances, you can only impeach certain officers. So it specifies that the president, the vice president, and other civil officers of the United States um, can be impeached or subject to um, House impeachment. And it specifies that they can only be impeached um, under circumstances of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Um, other high crimes and misdemeanors is um, uh, obviously a somewhat open-ended and vague term. It's a term that's borrowed um, from parliamentary practice, um, but doesn't have a lot of very specific content even in that context. What the framers are thinking of uh, really is that they want a term that's flexible enough um, to deal with a variety of misconduct that might arise um, down the road uh, without necessarily cutting off uh, too many things. But they also want to highlight that it has to be serious misconduct that actually justifies um, the necessity of removing somebody early. It can't be sort of the normal policy disagreements um, that you might expect um, the executive branch and the congressional branch, for example, um, to get into, or the legislative branch and the judicial branch um, to get into in general. They also put a substantive constraint um, on, the, on the consequences of impeachment um, that's notable because it also departs from the British practice um, in that the Senate can do no more than convict somebody, and upon conviction, they can do no more than removing them from office and disqualifying them from future office. They can't themselves impose any criminal penalties um, on that individual, which Parliament, in fact, had the power to do. Um, so then somebody could be um, transferred over to um, the criminal justice system and they might be charged with crimes within the criminal justice system in ordinary courts, um, but the Senate itself could not impose any more punishment um, than simply removal from office, which makes the impeachment much more of a political process ultimately than it is a kind of criminal process um, that you could imagine it otherwise being if it was possible for the Senate, for example, to actually throw somebody in jail um, or even execute somebody uh, for engaging in the crime of treason, for example. Thank you for listening to this episode of the number 86 lecture series. The spirit of debate of our founding fathers animates all of the number 86 content, encouraging discussion and critical reflection relative to how each subject is widely understood and taught in law schools and among law students. Subscribe to the number 86 lecture series on your favorite podcast platform to have each episode delivered the moment it's released. You can also go to fedsoc.org forward slash number 86 for lectures and videos on federalism, separation of powers, the judiciary, and more. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash N-O-8-6. Thanks for listening. See you in class.